So let's talk about trial batching and testing. So almost, I should say all, not just almost, but all concrete mixture designs should be trial batch. That should be kind of your last step. ACI 211, that's kind of their last step is doing a trial batching. You go out and figure out, you know, you can design all you want on a piece of paper, but what does it look like um, in real life? And that's kind of what brings me to, there's different types of concrete. There's Design Creek, there's Lab Creek, and then there's Field Creek. And I, I believe there may even be a fourth one, but these are the three that I'm, I kind of talk about where you have design creek where it looks great on paper, but you know, it's, it's, it's just a design. It's not, you know, you don't know if it's real concrete or not. Then you have lab creek where, you know, it's a creation, you know, you take your lab design, you go in the lab and you make the concrete and you test it. And, you know, you can kind of get some good insights, but it's really not the same as actually going in the field and making that mixture. Then we have Field Creek, which is, you know, taking that lab mix and actually going out and placing it in large quantities in the field. And so a lot of times you will see different uh, behavior and properties and, and, and stuff with a Field Creek mix than you will a Lab Creek mix. So just kind of be aware there's some differences. That's why People kind of make, you know, kind of joke around with concrete and say there's three different types. You have Design Creek, Lab Creek, and Field Creek because they can all three, you think they all three uh, can perform differently. Um, so, but at the end of the day, when we're, after we get done with a trial batch, we want to make sure that, you know, it may look great on paper, but how does it test? How does it look? You know, what, how's it going to perform in the field? How's it going to test in the field? So trial batching is kind of an iterative method. It's actually, a, a, you can, I always think of it as kind of like an iterative method of, of even designing concrete, where you may take a, you know, if you see this flow chart over here, you may take your initial mix design, you, you go out and you trial batch, you do your testing like slump, you don't wait air, um, whatever other test that you that you want to look at, and then you say, does it meet the requirements? If it's yes, then great, that's that's awesome. Um, then it met the requirements, especially the first time out the gate. Sometimes it does not, but if it does, then you may want to go out and do a, mo a small mock up in the field or um, you know, go find a small job and, and see how it works. And then, so this is really great, this whole trial batch process, because you can kind of look at problems. In the lab, you know, get, get the problems kind of uh, adjusted. So if it didn't meet the requirements and you know, there's a problem, then you adjust your mixture proportions, your admixture dosages, whatever you need to do, and then you retrial batch it. A lot of times, even the exact admixture dosage and water content, these are these are things that are, are are adjusted a lot of times in the lab, so that you know things like air content, water reducer, uh, mixing water, those are all kind of adjusted a lot of times in this trial batch process, so that uh, you know exactly how much you need of of each of those. Um, so it's, it can be really powerful for that because, you know, when you look at things on paper and you say, well, this water reducer, if you use it this dosage, it may reduce your water content by 8% or 7% or 12%. But is that, you know, is that a real number or not? Because you, it's going to be different for, for every cement, fly ash, all the different, you know, admixture, or all the different uh, admixtures and, and aggregates and stuff. They're all going to you know, interact differently. So you kind of have to be careful. And this trial batching process can really give you those insights where you know you can kind of dial in those dosages. Um, I should also say this doesn't usually take place of batching concrete in a truck. So sometimes what they'll do 
um, for trial batching process. They'll even go out and use a ready mix truck at the batch plant and they'll just batch, you know, a few yards. And just to see, you know, how, how this looks so they get better insights. So some of the problems that I've seen with trial batching is that people don't always use a large enough volume, especially for the mixers they have. Sometimes their mixers, um, they may be, a, you know, a, a, say like this one over here is a three and a half cubic foot mixer um, is, how, is, is how big it is. And really you can't use any more than uh, anything less than about one cubic foot. It just doesn't work very good. And really, in fact, uh, most mixers, if you, uh, I've seen a lot of mixers that are at, you know, three cubic feet and even maybe, you know, two and a half cubic feet. And really, um, when you start getting under that one cubic foot mark, it, it, with the, with a coarse aggregate and, and everything else, you really don't, you don't really don't see, it, it really becomes lab creek where it really doesn't look like, uh, may not look like what you're going to see in the field. So you got to be real careful. I see some people who go out and use, you know, a half a cubic foot or, or a third of a cubic foot. And really it's, it's just not enough. It doesn't give you the insight. It doesn't always look like the concrete that you're going to have in the field. So you can't have too small. That's why I always recommend you need to be at least one cubic feet. Uh, but it does largely depend on your mixer. As your mixers get bigger, your that that minimum number needs to go up. You can also go out and use a ready mix truck. And again, like I said, the ready mix truck, just like the the the, the drum that's in the um, lab that you usually use, the ready mix truck. You got to be careful with that. There are eight yard trucks out there. There's ten yard trucks out there. There's twelve yard trucks out there. And there's you know probably even higher than that. But that's kind of the the three normal. Uh, sizes of, of truck drums I see and you know they're going to have different minimum qual quantities too just to be able to produce concrete you know look look consistent anyways and, and be able to mix it up and for it to all be homogeneous so a lot of times for an eight yard truck I may see two yards getting batched um, you know and so 10 or, 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 you know, 10 yard truck, I might see three or four yards even get batched just to, you know, make sure it's, it's enough to, uh, enough concrete. So I'll be able to mix properly in that drum. They'll go out and they'll do some trial batching, right. You know, we're just right outside their lab uh, of the concrete, you know, uh, concrete producers batch plant. And it can be really insightful just to see that concrete and see how, um, see how your equipment, uh, batches everything and and how whether you're using a citral batch plant or a dry batch plant how everything um, you know gets batched together and put um, and that final product is uh, you know comes out the back of that concrete truck so it really does help you with all the equipment seeing how you know if that mix is going to work or not especially for you know doing when we're dealing with specialty type concretes and stuff it can be really helpful so let's talk about another thing, the volume of trial batching. So how big of a volume do you need? I get that, you know, you need enough, a minimum amount for, uh, to be able to mix the concrete, depending on what your drum size is. But, you know, for your actual test volume, you need to make sure however many cylinders you're making or you're using air bowl, air pot, um, you're using flexural beams, slump, whatever you need to calculate all that kind of in place because you can you know things like the slump test you can reuse that to make cylinders with but you can't use it for your air bowl after after uh, you go and you measure air in that in that with that with that concrete sample of 0.25 roughly then you really need to discard that it doesn't need to go back into your wheelbarrow you don't need to use it for cylinders there's water already in it um, so you need to just discard that 0.25 cubic feet. Um, so you just need to kind of, uh, you know, do the basic math to figure out how much minimum volume you really need. So let's say this is kind of an example of two cubic feet. If we come in 
and we want to take, and these are our design weights by a yard, by one yard, and we want to convert to two cubic feet. So two cubic feet divided by 27 cubic feet, because 27 cubic feet is in one yard of concrete. So this is kind of your conversion. So you can run through and do, um, say for water, 237 pounds of water times two divided by 27 gives you 17.6 pounds. You run through each of these and, um, you know, and convert these down to a trial batch weight per two cubic feet. You can even do, if you, if you want to, this 4,003 pounds times two divided by 27. And there will be a slight rounding error with this. You know, it won't be perfect, but it'll be pretty darn close. So after we go and we do the math to uh, make our mix smaller, you're going to have a trial batching, trial batch mixing procedure. So you batch all your weights out, maybe use buckets, put all the, the rock and the sand, the cement and, and the water, you put everything together. Maybe you get your uh, add mixtures either in, you know, syringes or use uh, some type of, you know, beaker or you know, anything, something like that. And now what, how do we put all the, all the stuff together? So the goal is, is to make things homogeneous. You don't want to have some weird reactions happening with, with how the chemical admixtures are added through the batch. So there's some basic stuff, especially with manufacturers that you need to, need to focus on. Um, I think that the ASTM that talks about mix the mixing procedure really needs a little bit more work um, to be to be to be up to where I think it should be at but typically the mixing procedure that I see at most places that, that people will use is they'll add all the rock all the sand and two-thirds of, of the of the water um, sometimes it's three-fourths of the water but usually I see the numbers are about two-thirds really and they'll mix that, the water and the aggregate together to make sure it's at SSD. And then right after that, the two minutes, they'll turn the mixer back off. And again, you want that mixer to be at, uh, whenever you're loading, you want it to be at kind of a, um, a pretty, a pr probably a 45 degree where none of the material is going to fall out of that mixer whenever you're adding it. But whenever you start mixing with it, um, you need to tilt it where it's you know all it, where it's more slightly um, elevated. Um, slightly, it has how do I say this? It's not uh, it's not at forty five degrees, but it's not at it may not be exactly at zero either. So there's kind of may have like a fifteen degree tilt depending on what your, what your mixer looks like. Um, the goal is, is whenever that mixer is going and it's mixing all the materials together, you don't want it to fall out of the mixer. So you need to have it, you need to have the tilt just enough where all those materials are going to mix together and they're going to, you know, fall in such a way where they don't get just, you know, they just don't um, stay in the drum and ride in the same spot on the drum. You want that entire mix to be turning over and moving. So after you add all the aggregates in the two thirds water, you mix it up for two minutes, get it at those aggregates pretty close to SSD, surface saturated dry. That's whenever you turn your uh, mixer off, you add your cement, you add your fly ash, you add, you know, whatever else cementitious materials you have. And then this is when you usually add your one third water. So you add the rest of the water, add your tail water, whatever you want to call it. And that's usually a lot of times people may will add an admixture in there too. I like to just turn the mixer back on um, before any admixture is added and let that cement and, and water and everything kind of um, kind of start mixing together. And once, you know, maybe it's about 20 or 30 seconds in, once uh, it starts kind of looking a little bit more like concrete, what I'll do is I'll add my uh, water reducer if I have it, if it needs it. 
a lot of water reducer to get the right get about where I think the worker building may need to be at. And then I will add my ad mixture, uh, um, air entrainment ad mixture. I'll add any of the other ad mixtures in there that, uh, you know, according to the manufacturer, that won't necessarily interact together. And again, with ad mixtures, you really need to go and, and check with your uh, manufacturer, you know, what their what their guide guidance is, because it could be a little different than what I'm telling you here. But uh, this is just how I do it, and I've, I've found very, very, very good success with it. So, um, and then after, you know, and that's whenever I start my two minutes of mixing is after I add all my admixtures. Um, I do my two minutes of mixing, and then I um, let the mixer rest for two minutes, or let that concrete rest. Uh, I clean the fins and the drum, the outside or the inside of that drum, make sure nothing's sticking. There's no clumps or balls or anything anywhere. And then um, that two minutes is extremely important because your chemical admixtures, especially like things like a water reducer, what we've actually found is there's a like a uh, uh, a mini false slump type. Uh, behavior um, you know at the very 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 beginning after that admixture is added and mixed and really it the admixture needs to settle for a little bit longer over time to kind of um, I guess the best way to say it is to tighten up to to get to, to for that water reducer to stop pushing the cement particles so far together and those cement particles will um, kind of rebound and come together a little bit more. Um, so the workability goes down slightly and it goes to a certain, you know, a certain uh, workability that's pretty consistent for, you know, hopefully 45 minutes or so, um, depending on what your mix is. So it's pretty consistent until you hit initial set. Um, so you really wanna wait that two minutes. Then after that two minutes, you will go and you'll mix for two more minutes just to make sure everything's, you know, in there. If you had any clots, anything like that, that you found on the side of the drum or in the blades, this is the kind of the time that kind of mixes everything together. And then you're ready to test. So what type of testing um, are we doing? Well, trial batch testing is the initial internal lab testing. So whatever you do in the lab. You also have quality control testing. So this is after the mix, because then I went through a trial batch and you're actually producing at the batch plant for projects, this concrete. And so you can go out, uh, maybe, you know, it could be production testing from the plant or it could be even from the field. Um, you know, you may even hire concrete producer, may even hire a quality control um, company to come out and do some of the testing for that project. You also have quality assurance testing. And so quality control and quality assurance get confused sometimes, especially how we do it in, 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 uh, in concrete construction. Because quality assurance testing is actually the owner testing um, from the field. So sometimes owners will hire third-party labs to do the testing and the concrete producer will also use that as their quality control testing for um, the project, which isn't technically correct, but um, they don't want to spend any more money than they have to doing the testing. So, you know, all the results are there. So, you know, they, they, they call it good. Um, you know, but concrete producers can hire a third party company to come out and do the testing too. You also see with quality assurance testing, a lot of times like state DOTs will have an inspector that will come out and make um, test, you know, make, make, makes, you know, concrete cylinders and do slump and air and everything. And they'll compare their numbers to um, the third party lab, the quality control lab um, that the concrete uh, contractor hired. And so um, that's really common, you know, and they'll compare both of those numbers 
obviously the one from the state DOT, they won't test nearly as much as the third party quality control company, but, um, and that, and that's, you know, it's perfectly fine. They're, uh, the state's mainly doing sometimes doing more spot checking than anything else. And again, I should say that every DOT is a little different. So you may, your DOT may run a little bit differently, but from my experiences, that's kind of how a lot of them will, will work. Um, when we talk about secondary testing, so after concrete usually gets hardened, you may have secondary testing that comes out. So things like, you know, the strength results didn't look very good. So we're going to go out and make cylinders or go out and, and, and core cylinders, or if there's something weird with this delamination, concrete surface is starting to pop up. I think, I think there, you know, something going on. So you may go out and figure out, um, you know, you may do some more testing to figure out what's actually happening. But for what we're doing, you know, this is the trial batching testing. So the internal lab testing normally. So usually you run things like slump, unit weight, air. Uh, a lot of times you'll even do things like calorimetry where you measure the heat of hydration. So how much, how much heat's being generated from the cement and uh, reacting with the water. And you can actually find some pretty cool. Uh, you can actually you know, find some pretty cool uh, um, behavior results from that, where you can kind of estimate setting time and strength. Uh, you know, if you think about maturity meter, uh, maturity meters are super helpful, especially at the first, within the first uh, three days, maybe even up to seven, at uh, being pretty accurate at at telling you what your compressive strength of the concrete is. Um, so um, that, that can be a super helpful tool. You also have things like uh, the, th the three point curve where you can make different, you know, very, very, very similar mixes, but just different water cement ratios. And you can plot them on uh, the compressive strengths of them. And you can figure out where do you exactly need to be with the water cement ratio to get to get to the certain strength design that you need. So these three point curves are super helpful and there's many other tools out there. This is some of the stuff that I see because everybody's focused on getting paid for strengths and they want to make sure like with slump that they're getting the workability that they, that they can. So when we talk about Three point curve. This is literally, you know, um, a linear line normally, and you can actually even get an equation and an arc squared valued, kind of like you saw with the maturity meter there. Well, that's kind of how you can do the same thing with um, water cement ratio versus compressive strength. You can make a trend line and it will give you an arc squared value. R squared, the closer it gets to one, the more of a correlation it is to. Um, for the for those data points, so I should state that uh, you know this is actually a fairly common way for people to iterate to a trial batch too, where they have a similar mix, but you know maybe their you know their normal mix is three thousand or four thousand psi, and they really need to design something that's at you know maybe fifty five hundred or six thousand, and so what they're doing is, is in essence. They're going out and doing some more testing to figure out where they need to be at. So this is a really cool way of, of getting there and finding those trends and really understanding how your materials all work together to produce strength. Then you have admixture dosage rate is another thing. So you can use a linear line to go out and measure um, your air volume uh, versus your dosage rate. Um, this can be pretty helpful so that you can kind of dial it in so if you overshoot way too much or you're um, you know if you're trying to hit five percent air six percent air and you shoot you hit eight percent air well that's okay if you measure it before there's any anything added and then maybe you um, overshot too far you can actually go back and make some pretty pretty easy correlations to figure out where roughly you need your dosage rate to be at to, to hit your 
um, air target volume. Should also point out so with like water reducers, that you're going to have especially plateaus. So you have a minimum minimum threshold where you can add up to a certain point and uh, into the concrete, and concrete will not even change the performance behavior. They won't even notice that there's anything there's an admixture in there, and then boom, all of a sudden you'll start seeing um, performance differences. And usually whenever it changes from, to performance difference, this usually, a lot of times you can see it as a linear relationship almost because it just goes straight, you know, it goes, um, you know, pretty, pretty uh, linear for a while. And then all of a sudden it'll get to a certain point where it starts plateauing that workability will or that performance will. And no matter how much admixture you add, it will not really change the performance too much. In fact, sometimes it'll even go down. So you really want to be within the sweet spot between your minimum threshold and then the, the, that plateau line. So it's important to kind of realize, um, you know, your manufacturer for your admixture will kind of tell you, you know, there might be two ounces per 100 pounds of cement. Um, that's that's the minimum the minimum uh, threshold value, and then they'll kind of tell you, well, you can't use more any more than 12 ounces per 100 pounds of cement, you know. Uh, so you gotta be kind of be careful, you know. You, you start playing close around 12, it, and it'll start plateauing out, and you're just really wasting your money for your admixture. Um, we like we talked about for calorimetry, these are great for high early strength mixes. Um, mixes that are extremely sensitive to to form work, and um, you really want to know the setting times and the um, you know early age strengths. This is great where you just make a cylinder and you put it in these boxes here that and they measure the heat of hydration. So it's they're they're awesome to use. This technology is really cool. Um, you can take that heat of hydration a step further where you can do maturity methods. So a lot of times I will go and make cylinders if I don't have this really cool box that we just showed you. And I will put um, cylinder or I'll put a sensor in the middle of those cylinders and, um, and it's a wireless sensor. And over time I'll wait until, you know, and I'll break these cylinders at different times and I can measure the amount of heat that's being released over time. And from that, we can calculate the maturity index, and, um, and we can correlate that maturity index to the compressive strength of that I measured. So it's a really cool, really cool method of doing that. It is a lot more variable at 28 days, 14 days, than it is at one in three days. So just you know, be aware of that. I should also state the maturity method is all is mixture specific. So um, obviously you're going to have every mixture is going to generate different different forms of heat, um, and as and so it'd be really hard to say, hey, because of the reaction with this one with you know with all these different mixes they're all going to have the same amount of of strength it just doesn't make sense so um you know for every new mix you're going to have a new maturity index so it's mixture design specific and you know maturity monitoring again you can go out and you can take these uh maturity uh monitoring systems just kind of like temperature gauge in essence, put it in the concrete and you can measure it over time. It's super, super, super helpful, whether we're talking cylinders or we're talking uh, an actual structure. Um, both can, can really benefit from this. So, so after we do our testing, so Dr. Cook, when do we know we have signs of a poor mix design? When do we need to re keep reiterating? I think we can kind of figure out that, you know, um, does it meet the requirements? Well, the requirements, you know, sometimes are a little bit more vague. I mean, I think most people 
you know, they realize that, okay, well, the minimum compressor strength is 3,000 PSI for this mix. And we've been testing, and it's been, you know, the average was 3,100. So that one really doesn't have enough of a uh, safety factor. Uh, the variability is going to be way too, too low. Um, we're going to have a lot more strength, uh, low strength results. So really we need to go ahead and find something that's going to meet closer to that 3,800 number. And so we may change our mix up a little bit more so that it is closer to that 3,800 number. We also have things like a large range of inconsistency. And inconsistencies can be from all sorts of different, whether it's materials, or um, how much a material is being batched into it, the plant itself and, and how inconsistent it is through the batching process and, and actually making the, the concrete. So you gotta kinda have to be careful when you're understanding the, the inconsistency parameters that go into it. You really wanna make sure that um, when we talk about inconsistencies, where they're coming from and how to make them, you know, kind of help eliminate them a little bit more. It may be that you realize that, oh, this one material that we're using is very inconsistent. So maybe we need to do a little bit less of it so that the inconsistencies go down some. Um, we also talk about the difficulty of, of batching and mixing. So if your mix just has major segregation issues or it's, it's very sticky. Um, it sticks to all the all the mixing and, and concrete, you know, the drum and, and everything. And it's just hard to work with and move and uh, make cylinders with. And you really need to think about why it's so sticky and is there a, a way to kind of change that? Or is there a way to change the segregation? I mean, you change up our gradation some. Um, do we need to add a viscosity modifier? I mean, what exactly is making it? Um, also, sometimes I've noticed with certain types of mixes, there's an excessive amount of time to make it uniformed. So time's money. So just just kind of, you know, realize that, oh, this is, you know, the homogeneous is just not going to work for this one mix. It takes us twice as long to mix it up than we do a normal concrete mix. So for cylinders because that's a lot of times what we get paid on um, you can have the standard deviation rating um, for ACI 214 talks about how to you know analyzing and estimating uh, compressor strength results where they came up with this table it's a kind of a pretty interesting table where they have performance different performance criteria versus your lab mixes and your field mixes and so you can go through and kind of see, okay, well, where am I at? If you look at the lab, the lab's about half the standard deviation the field mixes are. Um, I think that's how they kind of chose their numbers. So just kind of be aware of that. So, you know, a field mix should be twice as, um, you know, twice as inconsistent as a lab mix is what they're saying. So quality testing. So temperature, slump unit weight and air are all five basic tests that are all basic tests that you need to um, that, that you run out in the field every day. You also may compress the strength of cylinders and you need to make sure you cure those cylinders properly. So you know if you're used to ash tow those are the ash tow methods. If you're used to ASTM these are the ASTM these are ash toads. Um, I find that people, if they're doing state work, they're used to ASHTO. If they're in the private sector, they're used to ASTM. So I don't want to confuse people. Um, but we all, you know, we all call, we all pretty much understand the same, the same test methods. So, um, you know, understanding these these basic tests in the field and, and how they're all um, they're tested and you know, sampled and tested properly. You know, this, this picture should hopefully be ingrained in your mind if you've watched testing videos from me in the past where you have 15 minutes to obtain your wheelbarrow of your individual samples. And then you have five minutes after that to start 
testing slump, air and temperature. And then you have 15 minutes from the start of when you combine your individual samples and you remixed, you have 15 minutes to start making strength samples. So I think slump, air and temps, pretty easy to get done in within 15 minutes. So then you can just start making your strength samples after that. Um, so we talked about lab testing. We talked about just now with field testing, ACI uh, certified certifi certification is kind of all those different tests we talked about in the field. But then we also have secondary testing. So, you know, things like the rebound hander, hammer for uniformity. You have this uh, probe penetration resistance measure the uh, concrete strength. You also have like surface resistivity, the four point Weiner probe, Resipod um, is starting to get more and more prevalent. And then you also have things like this up here where um, you use ultrasonic waves. You can measure things like cracks and beams and, and, and concrete and stuff. So it's pretty cool a lot of the, a lot of the work that's, that um, you can do with secondary testing. So when we're going out to collect our historical data, um, it's important to realize that a lot of this data, you need it for a mixed design submittal. So these testing results, um, they're of the same mixture. They're not, you know, testing results of similar mix, mixtures all put together, but they should be testing results of just the mix that, you, that, that you're submitting. Um, and one test result is a mixture that was batched and tested. So you can't just make 30 cylinders, break the cylinders and say, yep, there's my 30 results. No, you have to make the concrete 30 times. That's the standard deviation. That's the historical data that they're looking for. And it is difficult to, to go out and make a mix 30 times. So how do you go out and make a mix 30 times and start collecting all that data? It's a real common question, especially for new new ready mix uh, concrete producers whenever you're going out and helping them with mixed design submittals and they're just like design this new mix how do we get there well so a lot of times you know you may take that mix and you go out to if you can use a residential um, use it for residential concrete um, there are different projects where on for especially for residential they don't necessarily require testing but um, you know they only need like one truck so they can go out in these smaller quantities um, less less liability um, situations and maybe you know and you can use that that concrete if it's if it meets the specifications of the job um, other times I've seen people where they'll just keep batching um, concrete in a lab um, and they'll just make 30 different results. And, and from that, they'll go and submit those are the results. Um, other times, like I said, um, you may not just use residential, but they just use different, um, different projects that don't require a mixed design submittal necessarily, but there is testing on it. And they'll go out and they will test that concrete. Um, and they'll get the results from that third party um, testing company. And so that's kind of how over time they can collect that data. So there's not exactly a great way of doing it, there's, but there are, but there are all multiple ways. And I will say that ACI 301 does allow for less than 30, um, 30 you know, data results. The problem is, is your mix may not meet the, the the uh, historical, you know, the, the requirements of 301, maybe that your compressive strength um, is too low still. So it was what I usually find um, where somebody wants to be at say 36 or 3,800 PSI for 3000 mix. And ACI says, no, 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 you have to be at 4,200. And they, you know, um, and, and that, you know, 400, plus difference um, can, you know, can mean cement and um, can mean money. So I kind of want to be careful. Another thing I should kind of mention about historical data is you, is you, you know, you've probably seen all this 
bell-shaped curve before, talking about, oh, you have mixes and um, you can make compressor strength results or you can collect slump or temperature or unit weight or air and to kind of, you know, put all, put all their, uh, put it all together. But you're like, well, how do I, how do I make this make sense? Well, what you can do is you can actually go and flip this over this, this bell shaped curve. And these are called control charts where you have your test value, your performance value. Um, and then you have occurrence or like over time on your X and you can plot what your um, values are. Normally you try to figure out your control target from your average. So the middle of this bell shaped curve um, is your usually your control target. And then you want to be two standard deviations um, for your control max and your control minimum. So just kind of be aware like this is a really easy technique. This is kind of an example here um, where you are monitoring your results. So you can see how um, for this, it's very, very tight. What's really interesting is whenever the data starts jumping, you know, it goes too low or too high and you're trying to figure out why and what's actually happening. And that's actually really good um, to go and see those to catch it on a control chart as opposed to seeing random numbers on a uh, on, uh, on a test report and you don't know when everything started. This way, whenever you plot everything uh, from your test, you can kind of see when things started or whenever things were looking good and things you know started to not look good. So then you can dial in and try to figure out, well, what was happening on such and such day. Um, so this is just an example of we putting it with numbers. So 4,200 PSI control target, and then uh, minimum compressive strength of 3,000. So they're really bumping this up to standard deviations um, to make sure that you don't even get close to this minimum compressive strength, uh, at least as good as you can anyways. So with anyways, that's what I have to talk about for uh, trial batching and testing and some historical results. Come back next time and we will talk about concrete mixture design submittals. With that, have a great day.